another episode of At Home with the Word. I'm Minister Fitzhouston. As always, we try to have a great lesson lined up for you today. Let's begin with prayer. Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for this Bible study show. And thank you so much for everyone who comes to watch this show at their appointed time. For we know it's no accident that each person who comes to this lesson was divinely guided to this lesson for some golden nugget there to take away, comprehend, and apply into their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My title today is very similar to one that I did for the Union Rescue Mission uh, as a sermon, but this one's the benefits of agape love. The benefits of agape love. Now sometimes I do the same title for both locations because sometimes when I'm given a Bible study title that coincides with the Union Rescue Mission, God takes a portion of that message and applies it to the mission and those who are in attendance there. And as a Bible study, I'm able to get more deeply into the golden nuggets of scriptures and discussion and a, different, a more one-on-one -on -one atmosphere for those who like this environment. So it's, it's a double-edged sword as far as benefiting both sides. Now, agape love is what? that love that only God can give. Loving people when they don't deserve to be loved, which is most of us, is God, God didn't save us because of anything we've done. He did it because He loved us. And He loves, present tense, loves us, not loved, loves us. So whenever you're feeling alone, depressed, all your friends have turned away from you, and, and, and you're looking at things in the world, God is right there with you. Good times or bad, God is always there with you. So you, if you're going through the darkest hour of your life and say, Lord, I need you, he's right there. He's waiting for you to say, I need you, and now he'll bring comfort into your heart. Because a lot of times when we're grieving or when we're depressed and we got all the dark energies upon us, the devil trying to take away our hope, trying to take away our love for God because the devil wants us to think God gave up on us, God thinks we're a failure, makes us feel guilty because we're unworthy. Those are all lies from the devil, which is why we always say what? The devil is a liar. That's his only job because he can't take your joy unless you give it to him. We've already got the victory through Jesus Christ. So he's actually fighting a losing battle and his only bark is to put distraction and negativity and doubt into your mind, hoping, hoping you won't know the power you're walking around with if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because if you got that inside of you, you're untouchable. But if you don't know you're untouchable, the devil will take that and run with it because what ignorance is knowledge for those who don't know how to use it. See, ignorant isn't, I used to think ignorant was insulting somebody. Ignorant, ignorance just means lack of knowledge. So if you're ignorant to the fact that you're walking around with power of Jesus Christ in you that can put anything the devil throws at you at bay. That's why it says, in the Bible it says, hold on to the Lord for, and you'll be able to withstand all the wiles of the devil. Stand still. Because, because his power, it doesn't say might be able to stand so that you will be able to stand against the darts of the enemy. Or what, and the Bible uses different words, darts, challenges, stress. I mean, whatever he's throwing at you, you will be able to overcome it. Because what? We've been given authority to trample over what? All the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt us. Those are promises. Promises are divine facts, not theories, facts. And you have to hold on to it, believe in it, have faith in it, then you'll know who you are in Christ, and then the devil can't touch this. Don't, 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 don't. Okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I like to play with the devil. Can't touch this. That's right. That's right, devil. Yeah, can't touch this. See, gotta, gotta get bold with the devil because he's boldly trying to destroy your life. So I get bold right back to him. Talk to him with, with an attitude. Get an attitude. Get you behind me. Satan, devil's a liar. 
from the pit of hell. I don't believe in anything this negativity is throwing at me. Look not at the things that are seen, but at things that are not seen. For things that are seen are temporary. Things that are not seen are eternal. So if you can see a situation right now, and it looks hopeless, that's the things that are seen. But look not at that. Now, they exist right now. But when you're looking at things that are not seen, which is the victory you're going to have over it. See, you got to see the challenges in front of you, but you've got to see the victory you're going to have over that challenge. See, that's why I always say this, this order. You got to see it. When you see it in your mind, you believe it. Once you believe it, you receive it into your heart. Once it's in your heart, now you expect it in advance before it comes. And then you start walking in it as if it's already come. And then, boom, there it is. You got it. See, that's the process of how you've got to hold on to all parts of your faith. Because if you can't see it, and that's where the devil is going to, that's where the devil is going to attack first. He doesn't want you to see there's hope. He doesn't want you to see there's a way out. He doesn't want you to see that God's love is all around you. He doesn't want you to see. He wants to blind you of the fact that you're walking around with all this power. And that's his only bark. But then once you're walking around with the power of Jesus Christ and know who you are in Christ Jesus, whoops, <laughs> there it is. The bark from the devil has been taken away. Because you're not walking around in fear. You're not walking around in anxiety, depression, going to drugs, uh, ballistic. I mean, you're not going through that direction because the peace of God comes into you when you're holding on to his promises. Now, that big prelude, <laughs> believe it or not, is part of my lesson. I just want to give you that reinforcement because God's love for us. See, that agape love, the love that we, can't not, we cannot achieve as humans, he gives us that kind of love. And in that love is protection. And see, when you know you're protected by that kind of love, that's why you have the peace that comes within you. Because he who dwells in the shelter of the Almighty, in Psalm 91, shall abide under, shadow, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Because when you're abiding in God's presence, knowing how much he loves you, which means also he protects you. That's where the peace comes from. Now, in this lesson, my text is actually from a verse we all have heard and know very well. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, just that scripture by itself shows what level of love, agape love, is. How many of you right now will say, well, give your son up to die for others? You, you go in the flesh, excuse me, you take your son and do it. See, <laughs> when we get into the flesh, you tell me to kill my only son, I'm not about to go that route. So that's where our flesh it limits us. And that's why we cannot cross over to agape love because agape love is that love that extends way beyond our even comprehending that kind of love. But if he gave his only begotten son to save the world, because somebody had to come back and reverse the damage Adam created by biting that apple with Eve. Because he was the only other person that did not come from the womb. Adam was created. So only another supernatural being, Jesus, was not born in the way of the flesh. The Holy Spirit came down, touched him, he was perfect. See, both are perfect in, in the eyes of birth. Adam was created from nothing. Jesus' immaculate conception Man had nothing to do with it, because if man had something to do with it, there would have been imperfection. So you have two perfect beings. The first perfect being made a mistake, brought the devil into the world to give him reign over everything in the world. And then Jesus comes along, the next perfect person, and dies for us for all of our sins, representing and covering all of our sins for those who believe in him. That's what the crucifixion and the death of Jesus and the resurrection was all about. He, his death and resurrection was covering 
every sin of every person who sinned past present and future if you believe in him those who don't believe well <laughs> there goes your insurance policy <laughs> it's that simple but that's what it's all about now I love how 1 Corinthians 13 4 this is what we're talking about love in general just love as far as human relationship love which is also included in agape love. The agape love is taking all the love we know in the flesh and then taking that love to another level which we cannot do. But this is what it says about love in general. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth it always protects always trusts always hopes always preserves love never fails that's what love true love is now when we are involved in a relationship and two people love each other that's how you can measure your love if if any of the things it says love is not, I just read, and you're in a relationship saying you love each other, but you are doing some things it said, but you're you're self-seeking and you're not, and you're keeping records of tit for tat. Well, you did this wrong, I did that wrong, you did this wrong. That's not love. So you can even just do a self-check if you look at, take your time to turn to chapter First uh, Corinthians thirteen four through eight. Look at those lists of what love is. And in your relationship, see if you're doing any of the things that it says love is not. And that's how you can fix your relationship by saying, oh, Lord Jesus, get me back in line with your word. Let this relationship be in line with your word because I want to do everything in your will. Love my wife, love my husband the way I should be loving. So when you get into other types of relationships, which I will be covering domestic violence in future, reverence, uh, future episodes because... Domestic violence in the church is high as out the church. And that definitely is another lesson, which I will be getting into very detailed because that is so far from the Word of God, it's incredible. I can't even measure that. So, now, so we got that. What love is as far as Corinthians. Now, when Jesus came with the new commandment, the new covenant, the two commandments in the new covenant, which were both ironically based on love, a lot of people think there are 12 commandments. No. The 10 commandments were from the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. When Jesus came in the New Covenant, the New Testament, basically his two commandments we're to live by covers the 10 commandments of the Old Testament. Now, of course, review right quick. What were the old, the old, old 10 commandments or what? You should have no other guy before me. Shall not make yourself a graven image of anything else above or below heaven beneath the waters three you shall not misuse the name of the lord your god four remember the sabbath five honor your father and your mother six you shall not murder seven you shall not commit adultery eight you shall not steal nine you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor ten you shall not covet your neighbor's house now that's the original ten so then jesus comes along and the new testament says well wait a minute I'm going to make it simple as if as if he worried about people remembering the 10. I'm going to make it simple for you. I'm going to reverse it and re reduce it to two. And what are the two? Thou shalt love the Lord. This is the first one. Thou shalt love the Lord my God with all thy heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength. This is the first commandment. Now that, now. That first commandment from Mark, I'm reading from Mark 12, 28 to 31, but this, these two, as you know, the, the, the disciples gave their variations of this in their books. Mark had a version, Luke had a version, Matthew had a version. I'm reading Mark's version of how, how he said it. But my point is, if you love the Lord with all your heart, all your might, mind, strength, you know how much love that is? That's loving the Lord with every ounce of your body. Now that kind of love of the Lord compared to the old commandments automatically 
you would not do commandments one through four because you love the Lord that much. What was it? One through four was what? Have no other gods before me. Make no graven image. Not, well, not misuse the Lord's name in vain. And remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Now, those four are automatically covered by loving the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now, the second commandment, like the first, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is no other commandment greater than these two. Now, loving your neighbor as yourself is covering commandments of the Old Testament 6 through 10, which is what? 6 uh, was, uh, f I mean, five, excuse me, it was 5 through 10. It starts with 5, honor your mother and your father. Uh, you shall not murder, not commit adultery, shall not steal, not give false testimony against your neighbor, shall not covet your neighbor's house. So 5 through 10 are covered by the second commandment of the New Testament, a new covenant. So realistically, Jesus didn't wipe and de delete stuff. He just said that I'm going to give you two commandments of love that will represent all 10 of the Old Testament covenant. Now we use those two because if you do those two things, the love in your heart and love for the Lord will control everything you're doing. Matter of fact, that's why the you hey, I had a blog, I a visual blog that said this is the answer to world problems. Because if everybody focused on love, loving the Lord, and loving your neighbor as yourself, there wouldn't be any war. But what is war? You're not loving your neighbor as yourself. You're fighting your neighbor for whatever it is, whatever petty things it is for centuries, or revenge, or anger, rage, I mean, all the things that cause war, which is not in the love is list. Now, that's what it means when we talk about how God's agape love is to cover all our lives, everything we do based on the new covenant. So, now, what does it mean that God is love? We always say God is love. God is love. God is an attribute of, uh, love is an attribute of God. Love is the core aspect of God's character. God is love. So, when somebody's, somebody's acting spiteful, well, God, God must have gotten mad. God gets mad at me, and God did this to me. God did. Wait a minute. God doesn't get mad at you. Now, God will give you some tough love to get you to where you should be. Just like in the old uh, Old Testament, when the Israelites, after that incredible miracle of the parting of the Red Sea, they get into the wilderness and start nagging and forg forgetting that miracle. Now I'm going like. I don't care how many years ago it was, if I witnessed the parting of the Red Sea, for me, I wouldn't doubt God for the rest of my life because I saw a miracle so in incredible that, that that's the living God right there. Yet, the Israelites would start nagging because they got in the wilderness, he delivered them, they start complaining, well, where's our food, where's this, where's this, like God's going to be their servant now. Now, to show you why he led them in the wilderness for so long, this should have been a very short journey, was when he sent Caleb and a few other the Israelites, I'm going to let you go ahead and show you the promised land that I'm taking you to. And and I just give you a peep of what's waiting for you on the other side of this wilderness. Because they're just, nah, yeah, 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 nag, 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 nah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Caleb goes, comes back, now, out of all the people that went with Caleb, only Caleb and a few others really believed that was a promised land and was praising God. Yes, we can take this. The others that were with him saw these giants that were in the land, and they actually said we were ants in our own eyes. How can we defeat those people in that promised land? How can that be a promised land? They're giants there. They're huge. And, and, and we were ants in our own eyes looking at these people. How are we going to beat them? So they were covered with negativity when they came back. Now, that disbelief is why the Lord said, you know what? I'm just going to wait to get all these naysayers and disbelievers just to die off and take only those who believe into the promised land. So... He kept him in the wilderness 
which should have been only 40 days, he kept them in the wilderness for 40 years until all the ones who doubted and talked about God and how come God did this, how come God did that, they all died off. And then the ones who were not affected by all that negativity moved on to the promised land. Now, that's a little tough love. That's why tough love. He, God didn't hate him. He just said, well, okay, well, I'm trying to tell you what I'm trying to give you. I'm trying to give you this land, and your limited mind can't believe that you can have it. Yet I just parted the Red Sea to show you the power I have. Now, I'm telling you, when you go to that land, that's going to be yours. That's the same power behind you. So why would you have fear and doubt if the living God who just parted the Red Sea shortly before just told you, now, next thing I'm going to do is give you that land. There shouldn't be any doubt. Well, they're gonna be, you should have been saying, well, well, those are some big people over there. They're giants. we got to fight them. I, I'm not scared. Hey, if, if God parted the Red Sea, he's going to give me the power to take them down. And that's the same kind of faith that David had against Goliath. See, the key phrase is when they said, we were ants in our own eyes. That's how they saw themselves in their own mind. See, we can limit the power of God within us by our own limitations of not believing we have it. That's why I keep saying over and over, you got to soak yourself with the word. That's why I made the, the healing prayer channel where you, you got prayers playing all day long. That's why I made the one hour prayers. Soaking yourself, whether it's my prayers or anybody else's prayers online, soaking yourself in the prayers and scriptures and studying his word is how you just fill yourself with word, empowering the Holy Spirit inside you so that none of this negativity and fear and anxiety and unrest, all these other things that try to come and steal your joy. When you're soaking yourself in the word, the devil can't touch you. And I made a joke about it earlier with the song, but that's a fact. So that's why I always say, if you've got stress and anxiety, you're looking at too much world. But if you look more at God, that equals peace of mind. And that's how you make that adjustment. Now, let's continue on. So then we got what was the love of Christ. Now, love of Christ, <laughs> we don't even have to say what the love of Christ. He died on the cross for us. So now, the love of Christ. Now, of course, just that night before crucifixion, Jesus had, and this is showing love is also obedience. Jesus, when he told the disciples, wait a minute, I'm going to pray. And he told them, I'm going to pray for an hour. And then they fell asleep. But in that hour, he was with the Lord. He had a brief, brief moment of feeling the flesh, feeling the fear of what had to happen the next day of being crucified. And he said, take this cup from me, take this, uh, uh, that, that, take this cup from me, Lord, take this cup from me. Well, that's really him saying, I, I, I don't know if I really want to do this. But then his love for the Lord followed right behind it and said, nevertheless, thy will be done. Thy will be done. I love you, Lord. And I know that if this thy will be done has to be done, and this is what I have to do to bring thy will to pass, thy will be done. And then the rest is history crucifixion, resurrection, all that. But that's where love is obedience as well. See, if you love somebody enough, you trust them. And that's the key behind trust. If you love the Lord and give him your all, you will trust him because if you look back at all the times he's moved in your life, he's never let you down. Now, sometimes he doesn't move in the way you want him to move. That didn't mean he let you down. That just means he didn't move the way you want him to move. What, what is the phrase? God is, he's, God is always there. He may not be there when we want him, but he's always right on time. See, when we want something to happen, we're thinking that's when it needs to happen because that's when we want it to happen. But when God actually makes whatever happen, when you look back on it, that's when it really needed to happen. When God moves, it's when it needs to happen. When we want it to happen, that's just our desire. See, God knows when whatever it is needs to happen. And that's why we, when we always say, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding. See, he knows more beyond what we can see. Our need to have something happen at a certain time is based on what we see. When he makes it happen, 
he knows well they don't need it right now when they gonna need it is right down here now we don't see that he knows we gonna need it at a later date not the date we want it so when he makes it happen whenever he moves in our life and that miracle that provision whatever it is we go oh man God was right on time because he, if he had done this last week, this this or that wouldn't have happened. But because he did it this week when it needed to happen, that's when it worked out perfectly. So God is in control of all things and knows when everything needs to happen. So now, that's so so we got into Christ's love, the love he died on the cross for us and gave his life, sacrificed fight himself for all of our sins and, and take away the sins of the world. That's more love he had for us because how many of us would say well man you know, I'm, you, know, I, you, know I, I, you know what I'm going down a, I'm going down across for you because I, I want to cover that sin you just did I'm just going to give my life eh, how many going to do that <laughs> I didn't wait a minute. I didn't see anybody raise their hands. <laughs> Why? Most of us, or most of us, all of us would not raise our hands because agape love is not attainable by the flesh. Agape love is that God only love, love that only God can reach. Now, we can shoot to achieve it by going through that list in 1 Corinthians and trying our best to make sure we've got all those elements of love in our life, in our relationships. That's the best we can do. Matter of fact, if we can even accomplish everything I read in 1 Corinthians, the, what love is, then you've got an outstanding relationship with your spouse, outstanding relationship with God. Because if you, if you can bring even just all those things listed to pass, then that's your closest you'll get to agape love. And that's a good goal to achieve because then you're keeping the peace beyond understanding in the midst of any storm you go through. See, see the storm is going to happen. See, devil's going to throw his stuff. We got chaos all around us. You watch the news, the world's going crazy. That's going to be happening. How we react to it is either through panic or we're going to hold on to God and walk through it in peace. Was it saying in Psalm 91? A thousand may fall at my side, 10,000 at my right hand, but no harm shall come to me because I know I'm protected by the God who loves me so much. See, it's a, it's a relationship. That's why loving the Lord is a relationship. It's not just about religion, going to church. It's about, it's about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And the more you study his word, the more you feel his presence, the more you see his miracles and his working every day in your life. There's something happening. Every, if, you, if you're actually doing a journal the way it should be done, every day you should stop and think, how did God move in my life today? It could be something as simple as being late and a parking space was open right in front of your job today. It usually is never open, but it was today when you needed it to be open. See, that should be recorded as much as a miraculous healing because all of them are signs of God moving in your life. God just doesn't move sometimes. God is moving every day in your life if you stop and take the time to look at it and give him praise and thanks. Now, so with all this being said, what is our goal? As I said in a past lesson, Ephesians 5, 1, be imitators of Christ as beloved children, verse 2. And walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So if we know the kind of love Jesus Christ represented and we work for that, then people see that love in us. A person should know that the love of the Lord is in you without you actually saying it. Just your personality and your behavior should show that you love the Lord. Because there's a peace, there's a light coming from you when you're letting God's light shine and you're just basking in His presence. Other people see that. They don't even know what that is. But they see something in you. And they'll actually say, you know, that's something about you. I don't understand. I don't know what it is. But you never seem to let anything rattle you. You always got this peaceful demeanor. Love the Lord. See, God will make it so that your only answer is your testimony. And that's the way it should be. First uh, John 4, 8. Whoever does not know God. No, excuse me, let me go back. 
Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. See, because God is love and you love the Lord, that love should be radiating from you and affecting others around you. But if that love is not coming from you, that's what it's saying, well, you must not know God because if God is love and you love the Lord, that love should be coming from your being. So that's what that, and then Romans, Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we are sinners, or while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That's talking about the, the love he had for us. I say it again, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, God died for us. Now, those are all examples of agape love when you're dying for somebody, laying your life down. Now, that's a little different than like, for example, we some, sometimes in the news or YouTube, we see many heroic uh, individuals. Somebody's about to get hit, hit by a car and they run and push the person out of the way and they get hit by the car and killed. Now, that's a heroic act, but it wasn't planned. It wasn't a decision. You're trying to save somebody's life in the act, that person gets hit and killed. When Jesus died on the cross for us, and when God said gave his only begotten son, that was, I've got to figure out how to help these people. Because you know, all these centuries, they've been doing all these sacrifices and going back to sin and sacrifice, go back to sin and sacrifice. I mean, I how many thousands of cattle were killed in the Old Testament. Sacrifice after sacrifice. But see, that kind of sacrifice was not meant to be forever. Because Jesus, Jesus as a matter of fact, let, let's look at, uh, uh, see. Go back to Romans 5, 5, 18 and 19. Well, matter of fact, no, look at no. Matter of fact, let's look at Hebrews 10, 1 and 2, even better. Hebrews 10, 1 and 2. Now, this is comparing. Remember, the old system, Old Testament sacrifices were given to cover your sin. You killed a calf or whatever it was, and all the different variations of sacrifices to cover your sin. Jesus comes along, and now he dies for your sin which means nothing else needs to be sacrificed because the Son of God sacrificed Himself to cover all of our sins, which replaced the sacrificing of animals. Now, this is explained why He did that in Hebrews 10, 1 and 2. The old system in the Law of Moses was only a shadow of things to come, not the reality of the good things Christ has done for us. The sacrifices under the old system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. Then he added, Look, I have come to do your will. He cancels the first covenant in order to establish the second covenant. And what God wants, it, what God wants is for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. So now there's no, necess no necessary need to go and say, well, ask Jesus for forgiveness, but I, I got to do a sacrifice. No, 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 no. You don't need to sacrifice anything ever again because Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and your sins. For those who believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. See, the new covenant has replaced the old. If you notice the comparison of the two, now, you know, God's behavior and his hatred for sin is equal in both covenants. It's just stated differently in the old covenant because Jesus hadn't come yet in the old covenant. So it was fear of God and wrath of God, all variations of the way God punished people or had to try to set them straight in the Old Testament. So when Jesus comes along in the New Testament and the New Covenant, then things are dealt with a little bit differently. Now, you have a choice to believe in Jesus or not. He tells you what he represents. He tells you what is considered sin. But you have the choice whether or not you want to continue a life of sin or follow Jesus. It's a choice. Whatever you choose will be honored and the punishment that follows will be in proportion to your own decision. But even then, he still gives you a chance. 
and that, and this is what some people really get upset with when um, when prisoners, for example, prisoners are in prison for killing somebody, and they've been on in on the uh, death row, whatever length of time, and just before they're about to pull a switch, any last words, and they say, "Well, forgive me, Lord, if I've sinned. I'm sorry for everything I've done," and then they get electrocuted. Now, will that person go to heaven? Yes. Now, here goes everybody. Well, why are you going? To, a mass murderer is going to heaven. How come he's going to heaven? He don't need to go. He need to burn in hell for the rest of his life. Now, don't be judgmental. Don't be judgmental, because if he truly is sorry for his sins after a life of sin, murder, and death, but he's truly sorry when they ask him any final words, and he's saying that truthfully. He will be allowed to heaven because for all have sinned and come short in the glory of God. Now, his reward in heaven may be different, as I've said many times, because why would there be a book of life and a book of works if that lifetime that you've had on earth is not also measured? See, that's what people forget when they get mad about that. See, if you've been giving all your life and doing things of God, and you get into heaven too, but your works on earth at some point is never described in detail in the Bible. But yet at Judgment Day, God opens up the book of life, which means you receive Jesus, and the book of works, which must mean that how you lived your life throughout your life, how much of it was giving, how much of it was evil, how much of it was loving the Lord, there must be some reward in heaven based around that book which is really mysterious, but if it's being opened right after the book of life, that means it has a heavy weight in heaven in some way. And I'll leave that one there. <laughs> but anyway, I just want to share what all the love of the Lord is all about, agape love, and the love we should be shooting for in our own lives to allow that to, to just flow through us and affect others around us. Because the more if all of us sought that goal, the love of the Lord will be touching everybody in almost like a disease, jumping from person to person, and everybody would be more at peace. Races would be at peace. Racism would not exist because racism and prejudices, those are taught. Hatred is taught to the next generation. If you let that go and let love come into your heart, then racism and prejudices would eventually finally melt away and we would really be a multicultural society loving each other, not hating each other because we're different and because it's being taught by those who refuse to let God's love abide in them and refuse to let the love abide in their children and therefore decide to teach hatred to their children to come up to be another generation of hatred of haters. God's going to deal with that in his own way. So don't even worry about it. God's got his hand and is watching everything. So, Father God, we just thank you for this lesson, Lord, of just just learning about what your agape love is all about. And just thank you, love. Thank you, Lord, for just loving us when we when you didn't have to. Loving us when we when we weren't on the right path. Loving us when we, we had no no purpose in life. But yet you still knew how you wanted to use us, kept your hand on us, and guided us to where we are now trying to live our life for you, Lord. We just thank you for your love, your agape love. And if someone watching right now does not know Jesus Christ and wants to start feeling that love and peace of mind, say these words with me. Father God, forgive me for the wrong I've done and the wrong I've been. I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for me and my sins and was raised from the dead so that those of us who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I want Jesus to be Lord and Savior of my life and I commit that I will not do a single thing in life without lifting it up to you first. In Jesus' name, amen. And that's where it all starts. Now, of course, once it all starts, like I always say, once you receive the Lord, 
all of a sudden you're going to start seeing things a little bit differently because now you see now you've received the lord holy spirit fill me fill me holy spirit fill me right now matter of fact you want anytime you want the holy spirit to to fill you further and, and with peace and whatever just take a moment and say holy spirit fill me say it with me right now fill me holy spirit Fill me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I want to feel your presence. I want to feel your peace. I want to feel your comfort. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, that was only about a minute or less than a minute. But what I just did just right there, when you might be having a rough day, a depressed day, a crying day, whatever kind of day it is that is not loving and happy and joyous, take that time just to be still and talk to the Holy Spirit, fill me, Lord, I need some joy, fill me with the joy, fill me with your love, and just be still. It's hard for us to stay still in this, in this world of chaos and rushing. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Don't let anything else come and steal your peace because that's yours. Let God take it. God fight for you. God win the battle for you. He'll take care of the rest. Hey, my name is Mr. Fitz Houston. I hope you enjoyed this lesson on agape love and just love in general, how we just need to be more love. And then I hope you enjoyed it. And, and until next time, with another great episode on something. <laughs> My name is Ms. Fitzhewson. Have a blessed week. And I'll be strong in the Lord. Amen.